with great thanks unto you all. We are glad that every one of you has chosen to be here tonight to focus on studying from the Bible. One does not have to go very far to find some type of means or system or ways by which one's fellow man is being helped or receiving the thoughtfulness of unselfish generosity of others. Sometimes humanitarian charitableness via corporations or general charities is what is being considered. We we'll just say, well, sometimes people are being helped by charities. Well, other times, good-natured individuals with open hearts decide to enact generosity in bestowing money or gifts upon others. Sometimes we just do nice things for other people. One thus today is responsible for understanding what the will of the Lord is when dealing with the important subject of benevolence. We need to know if the contributions people make for the work and distribution of the funds that are part of the collection for church work, we need to ask ourselves the question, does it really matter in the ways and processes of how those said funds are distributed? We're going to have a frank discussion about benevolence. This really does matter. We hopefully will explain in this lesson how church funds can be distributed. If one asks any preacher or elder if they have ever heard the following question, my guess is most would say, yes, I've heard this question, and various versions of this similar inquiry. So what's the question? Here it is. Hi there, what programs or missions and types of ministries does the church you go to participate in? Many then will respond, well, the church is in the soul-saving realm, so we engage in the things which pertain to salvation. We believe in helping others. Our members help others individually. And as a church, from time to time, we also support our members in need. But we choose to not go beyond that which is written in Scripture. That's a good answer, but it tells what we do that's right. It doesn't, however, explain to the one wandering and wondering about expansive programs or varieties of ministries. It doesn't specifically say what exactly is actually wrong with a variety of ministries or a variety of programs. So when someone asks this question, they want to know, what sort of things specifically is the church engaged in where you worship? But the question behind all that is really saying something different when that's asked. What it's really saying is, can you tell me what the mission of your specific church has been replacing things with? Would you inform me how you've specifically changed what would be mentioned as the mission of the church in Mark 16. Now, no one who asks their question that way is going to frame it that way because we would all agree, well, benevolence sounds good and doing good work sounds good. Yet, if we know that the gospel message when we read Mark 16, 15, and 16 is go into all the habitable world and preach the gospel to the whole creation, well, that's how souls are saved. So that's the limited mission of the church. Now, any other substitute would be an obvious diversion from that plan. Puppet show ministries, weight loss ministries, financial peace seminars, church league sports teams. Well, those are all things that for all intents and purposes are replacing the mission that we should agree is the mission enact, in, enacted by Mark 16, 15 through 16. Some would say, well, what about church charitable causes? Uh, what about things like food banks or supporting the United Way or the Shriners or the March of Dimes? What about organizations that are set up in the world as benevolent business ventures? 
can the funds from a church treasury be given from the church treasury to those causes? The answer is, a church can't spend funds and give funds to causes that aren't in the realm of teaching or preaching or the limited benevolence of assisting members of the church. However, we are supposed to be individualistically givers. The Bible makes it readily clear that the individual is to help the less fortunate. Many people, however, take the passages that relate to the individual and through misapplication place the book, chapter, and verse that relates to the individual and dub those verses as relating to the church. Let us examine what I'm discussing here for a moment. In Galatians chapter 6, there is an emphasis on the individual. Note both how many times it uses the word one or he or words that relate to the individual. And then also note in the context how many times the words within the context can only apply to the individual. Like when you read Galatians 6.4, look at the words one and individual and he, and then look at the context of what it's saying. It says, let each one examine his own work, and then he'll have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word in sharing all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth that, uh, he will also reap. Or if he sows to his flesh, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who soweth unto the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity to do good, let us do good to all. We are to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, as 1 Corinthians would teach us, so that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Yet some individuals are not immovable in the work of the Lord. They relate additional things to the church work and remove personal responsibility from the work of the individual. For example, in the Good Samaritan story, Jesus was teaching about who is my neighbor. He taught that a neighbor is any, anyone, an individual of any sort can help as an individual. The Samaritan saw the need, thus he had compassion, and he acted with personal benevolence towards the afflicted. He didn't run up the road and ask the priest or Levite for money from the synagogue to help subsidize his individual good work. The neighbor simply showed good care as an individual. Nowhere does one see people in the Gospels or the Epistles saying, now let's see what the church work, mission, program, or ministry can I pay into to do my responsibility. The individual Christian has the responsibility to help all the non-Christians that are in need from time to time. The Christian may help from their own money if needed. They may purchase food, gas, credit card, gift cards. They may give to charitable causes that also assist. Although, I'd suggest the vital importance of doing a lot of research when giving to a charitable cause, because often the charitable cause is just a church charity, uh, that thinks this lesson is too conservative in that respect and they should be more liberal and churches should give to another cause and that charity is really just another church uh, subsidy. The reality is that God's ways for benevolence works. We all know what it's like to see someone or something try to attempt 50 different things and do none of them well because they've not become all proficient in one area. So now let's look at the systems that God has set up uh, in two different instances of supporting those uh, from the church treasury, both preacher support, but also for individuals that are Christians uh, in famine benevolence. Let's look at these passages. There are certain times that in the church there were people that had need uh, or that had support from distributions of the church treasury. Certain times the church in the first century had needy Christians. And to quell the impending starvation that was looming along the bend, God set forth through the early church the specific way in which he wished for benevolence to occur. But before we talk about famine relief distribution, let's simply talk about preacher support. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 13 through 16, the Bible says, Nevertheless, ye have also done well in that ye shared in my distress. 
Now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed unto Macedonia, no other church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only, for even in Thessalonica you sent once and again for my necessities. So in Philippians 4, 13 through 16, we see at that particular juncture the idea that preachers can be supported from a local church. In this particular instance, the Philippians supported Paul in his work, and he didn't receive funds from any other church, because that one local church fully supported him. Also, we see times where multiple churches sent directly to Paul. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 8 makes it clear that Paul was not supported by the church from the town of Corinth in which he was laboring uh, to give him money to sustain him in his work at the church at Corinth. He said, uh, did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you, the Corinthians, free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. He's poetically saying, I received my funds from other congregations to help sustain me here while I was in Corinth. And thus, with this particular verse, we see we're in a plurality of churches uh, supports Paul in his work of preaching so that it could be described that sometimes churches send funds directly from one church unto the local preacher there, and other times, multiple churches send directly to the preacher, as you can see in this chart. However, in Corinth, he also chose to not receive wages uh, from the Corinthians. This doesn't, this, that doesn't mean that he wasn't supported to preach. It just meant he wasn't receiving funds from the local church in the location he was preaching, thus explaining he was receiving from afar. One should also understand, though, that churches sent funds uh, to one local church during the time of a famine relief distribution need. Let's talk about that. Let's look at this chart for a moment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and also in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 through 14, we see where specific churches sent funds directly to the elders of another church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, the scriptures say, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given orders to Galatia, even so do ye, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by in store, that there be no gatherings when I come. In that idea there that we see here, now concerning the collection for the saints. So if it's going to use the word saints, that means Christians. He's not saying they made a contribution to a local charitable organization. He's saying they set, f set funds, sent funds, and gave them to the saint funds that were the shepherds of that local flock. He gave the contributions uh, to local elders directly in that certain area. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do. Now couple that with 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9 through 14, where it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And in this I give advice, it is to your advantage not only to be doing what and began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also must be a completion of what you have, for there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack. So let me pause to explain what he's saying. He was helping others. He says in verse 14 that their abundance also may be supplied and so by your lack, they may have equality. So there's a famine relief that was needed in various churches. And so in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and 2 Corinthians 8, 9 through 14, he sent directly uh, to, to one church eldership. However, uh, sometimes it went the other way around. Uh, sometimes you had one church that sent to multiple churches in need, and one of the instances of this 
where one church saw that there were a number of churches that had a need was in Acts 11:27 through 30. So note in Acts 11:27 through 30, there's not a sponsoring church arrangement set up. We'll talk about that in a moment. But in Acts 11:27 through 30, it says, and in these days, notice the change in the chart, and in these days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch, then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed, and the spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Before we go any further with this, just because it said Agabus had visited Jerusalem and had been there for a while, that does not necessitate that Jerusalem is where all the funds would be pooled through or distributed through. It does not necessitate Jerusalem being the hub church or distributing church. Let me continue reading in verse 20. It says, Then the disciples, each according to his own ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. That's the phrase, dwelling in Judea. There were multiple churches in Judea, at least two that were mentioned by name on Paul's third missionary journey when he traveled to Jerusalem before he got to Jerusalem. Before he got to Jerusalem, he had already visited churches of Judea on the third missionary journey. And verse 30 says, This relief or famine relief to the brethren of Judea, this distribution of that verse 30, it says they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And that's what it says they did. So what we see in the scriptures regarding church funds and distribution is sometimes an individual church will support their local preacher, like Paul and the Philippians. Other times, various churches will send individually preachers' support distribution to an individual preacher. And that's regarding preacher support. But then when we talk about giving or benevolence for the members or for Christians, other times Christians do help other Christians. And Christians will help other Christians in various local churches when there's a grave emergency. For example, in the famine relief distribution given in 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Corinthians 8, in small sums from small local churches to one local church, that was done. Other times, one local church, such as Antioch, had a financial ability to help smaller churches, and rather than send money directly to Jerusalem to distribute the church to the church at Antioch, they just simply sent by the hands of Barnabas and Saul directly to the elders of those said local churches. And that can be found in Acts 11, uh, 27 through 30. There are so many things an individual can do. An individual can help uh, any other individual in need with their own money. It's their call. They can do what they want to do with their own money. If they wish to support a charitable organization as an individual, they can do that. Like I said, do your research, but if they wish to help pay money to their neighbors for picking up leaves around the yard, they can do that. It's their money, but we get into a realm where we see no biblical pattern or authority when individuals coupled with organizations, coupled with churches, all just collectively send their money to a sponsoring church and have that one sponsoring church decide what to do regarding sending to a whole bunch of other churches. It's just that, that pattern's not in the Bible. There's no scriptural way that we can find anywhere in the Bible for church A and church B to send their funds to a sponsoring church that decides how to distribute the monies to other churches or benevolent works or causes. As you can see on the slide behind me, uh, that's just not found with Scripture in the, in the Bible. Churches have no business being involved in benevolent works uh, that are set up in the sense of charitable organizations or orphans' homes or hospitals. And in one case, I know of one local church that basically owns an entire city block of various businesses. That's not the work of the church. When we look at the work of the church, it's not for these good organizations to come from the church. 
Just because a thing is good doesn't mean it's in the realm of what the church has authorization to do spiritually or scripturally. Uh, we certainly can have good organizations, but they need to be run or set up or operated by individuals. When you actually think about the idea of Christian business ventures, many of them are quite good. Yet the church is not a business. The church is the bride of Christ, unto which she died and shed divine blood so that her focus would be telling the lost world about Jesus Christ. Although the church itself is very limited in the types of benevolence it is able to do, this doesn't mean the church is not a giving church. What it means is a congregation that is set up scripturally will use its inflow of monies in a way God has authorized. When you're thinking of giving to a charitable organization, don't you basically look up the fine print and decide well, whether you're going to give to the organization based on how it's set up? Thus, when you're thinking of giving to the Lord, isn't it nice to know he's written 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Corinthians 8 and Acts along with Philippians 4 and 2 Corinthians 11 through 8, the types of ways he wishes for his said monies to be used for? A discussion like this is worthwhile from time to time. No, we don't have to talk about it every week, but it's worthwhile to discuss. What sort of benevolent works has the church been involved in? Well, we've talked about the ones the Bible's been involved in, helping people when there was a famine. Sometimes there's a grave need, and the church rallied together to help their brethren. They just did it in a very specific way, sending the monies directly through the, the apostles and Barnabas to the local elders of a local church not creating some sort of mega organization to distribute funds. They said, there's a need, let's get it to that local church in the scriptural way, and vice versa. And also, they didn't create a charitable organization outside of the realm of the church to help people. Yet today, benevolent works concerning people of church work, if I can call it that, have been involved in all sorts of things. I'm not going to give an exhaustive list. I'll just say maybe a couple examples here. I was once at a particular meeting wherein a family was gathering in a particular venue, and at the end, the vice president of a college said, we will gladly take any funds from individuals or churches to help sustain our college. I've only heard that once, but I did hear it in a room with a number of other people. One done by any of the college I ever attended or was associated with. The college I went to in Florida is a college that from its inception has not taken funds from churches, but hearing what I heard directly from another college dean in a private meeting that I was in where fundraising was done in a private setting certainly informed me that there are a number of colleges that are supported by churches that fund institutional causes. Now listen, I use that phrase institutional supporting only to mean that they receive funds from churches to sustain their noble works as institution. Now y'all, I'm not opposed to institutions of higher learning but I'm not going to give church funds to fund tuitions for people to attend colleges from the church treasury. I'm very grateful and thankful that our elders here know what's to be done with church finances. But here's my second example. I once was a visitor when I was about 15 years old. When I was in some summer travel, I was at a church on the eastern seaboard. I noticed in their bulletin article, they mentioned various charities they were supporting. They made it very clear and very plain that some of the monies that were coming from the contributions of the saints were going to non-saints. Obviously, it's totally fine if a visitor wanted to walk into an assembly and give money to a church they're visiting, but it's also important to know it's not a requirement. So at that juncture, I didn't in any way open up my wallet and support as a visitor giving to a church that's going to give their funds to a non-Christian or charitable cause. Even as a teen, I had the opportunity to listen to things and read things to exercise discernment. However, when I open up my wallet today, and I don't think it's just me, I think there are others like this. When I see what is contained within my wallet and I look and I see three or four different restaurant cards from various restaurants, not just one, but a number that'll be able to help people in need because I keep them when I see someone who might need a meal, and that's something I as an individual can do. It's something you can do as well. Have restaurant cards from various restaurants, not just McDonald's. It could be of any tier level of restaurants. You can go to Walmart and see a whole stack of them. I as an individual and you as an individual, as an individual can do as well to help others. 
I don't have authority to take money from a church treasury and give it to not, and then take that money and give it to one not associated with the church. But I can help other people. That's my responsibility. And so in our study of benevolence, this study in how the funds are distributed, it has nothing to do with saying all those Christians that don't believe in supporting orphan homes from the church treasury and supporting church charities or they, and colleges from the church treasury. Oh, it's one of those cases where they're just stingy, uncaring people. No, no, I can give money to colleges as an individual, which I sometimes do. I can give money to charities, which I very much certainly sometimes do. I can give money to individuals on the street. I can do that. But we don't allocate church funds and purchases uh, from the church treasury in ways that aren't found in Scripture. We individually allocate funds and purchases as individuals to maintain doing good works for the less fortunate as individuals. We just don't assume we have the endorsement of God to engage in sponsoring church fund distributions or charity causes from the church treasury because there's no pattern of it in the Bible. And this lesson has shown we actually do have a specific and patterned alternative. Now notice, I've not used the terms liberal and anti because the reality is there is no need for name calling or labeling. That's not fair. A lot of people on both sides of the issue, they haven't even heard a sermon like this. And the reality is they're not preached in many congregations. I'm not gonna call people liberals. And I'd like for you to not call me anti. If you think we're anti going to college or anti helping the less fortunate or anti foster care, or anti adopting orphans, that's not being fair to us at all. Yet, brethren, we can all stand up for the phrase, speak where the Bible speaks and remain silent where the Bible is silent. We can call Bible things by Bible names and do Bible things in Bible ways. You see, my dearly beloved friends and brethren, this is not an issue that doesn't have an answer. It's an issue that has an answer. In the scriptures, benevolence was given for evangelism, edification, and the care of needy saints. I appreciate your kind attention. Thank you for your kind attention during this lesson. There are probably many more things that could be said, but I wish to succinctly say when someone comes up to you and says, hey, what programs or missions or type of ministries does the church you go to participate in? That we'll be able to say, we follow the plan of salvation and our mission is to save souls. We minister to the needs of all through the scriptural ways that we're told to and we don't give in benevolence to causes that we don't have the authorization to as a church. We've not replaced the mission of the church with various social causes. And we can give, we can help people as individuals, but we, we meet our individual needs without practicing uh, things that we don't have authorization for. If you also notice, uh, by way of conclusion for the lesson, there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible uh, where you can just say, read this sinner's prayer and say the sinner's prayer and you become a Christian. The Bible instead has a plan of salvation that is so simple you may follow it as well. In order to be saved, you must be one that is hearing God's word through faith. You must be one who is believing Christ and his life that offers redemption to you. You must believe that one is professing via confession that you wish for Christ to be your Lord and that you uh, must uh, believe in him, thus by turning in repentance to say, get out sin and get in Jesus, and then Jesus gets in, if you will, if we can use that phrase, when the blood is applied. And you contact the spiritual frame of Christ when you were baptized with him and raised to walk in newness of life in accordance with Acts 8 and 6 and Acts 22:16. Don't delay. Don't wait. Get up and be baptized. Have all your sins in your life cleansed and purged. And then you can go on your way rejoicing. If we can help you in this journey heavenward, so that an abode with the Lord will be your eternal destination, please do sit on the front row during the singing of the song that hath been chosen.